I don't think you'll find anybody who is going to sit here and tell you with a straight face that what we are doing right now with Title IX on college campuses is working. I don't think anyone ever thought that colleges and universities would be adjudicating and holding court regarding sexual crimes in America, but that's what it's developed into. Some college attorneys cynically looked at this and said, we'd rather be sued by the person who's accused than the person bringing the accusation. At every step of the process, I felt like they assumed I was guilty. Reporting it didn't really help at all. It kind of made matters worse. What if you were in that position? Would you want to be silenced and just found guilty on the spot? The process was more harmful to me in a lot of ways than what actually happened to me. One of the best ways to think about Title IX is that in 1972, Congress threw a pebble into a pond. And the ripples have continued outward for more than 40 years. And so today, Title IX addresses a broad range of behaviors that it probably didn't back in the early 1970s. The initial Title IX protections really favored faculty members who were not achieving gender equity in the workplace. But then through the 1980s, Title IX really came to be almost all about sports and equity in athletics. Then in the 1990s, the courts again expanded Title IX when they were asked the question, would sexual harassment create a barrier to educational opportunities for women? The courts said yes, but the courts didn't give a lot of clarity to what a school should do. So in one school, there may be decisions that tend to be victim favoring. At another school, there may tend to be a process that is favoring the responding. So I received an email informing me that I was being charged with violating the student code of conduct. I had been accused of sexually assaulting someone. So October uh, 2016 uh, is the alleged sexual misconduct that the uh, accuser accused me of. The encounter itself was in the summer of 2014. I mean, when I received that letter, honestly, I was very shocked, but uh, I knew that I had to do something about it and present my case. At the time, um, the rule at my university was um, anyone who had been accused of sexual misconduct could not utilize any university resources in his or her defense. The letter did state that I should meet with the investigator uh, for the initial kind of like uh, interview. Right when I walked in to that interview, what, what the investigator had said is that if you're not ready to take responsibility now and we proceed to a hearing, um, you're likely to be expelled. I was completely denying it. It didn't happen. This was a group encounter, lots of eyewitnesses. There were three other people besides us two in the room. He found me responsible without a hearing of facts. At every step of the process, I felt like they assumed I was guilty. I mean, I did everything I could. Every single thing. I appealed everything. He still expelled me. It's a very delicate topic, right? Because everyone knows people who've been affected by sexual violence, everyone, right? And so it can be very tempting to just make it a totally black and white issue. Ask yourself this, what if you were in that position? How would you like to be treated? Would you want to be silenced and just found guilty on the spot without having your side be heard or evidence being shown? So after I was found responsible at the school level, I was suspended for six months. I pursued legal action against my school and was successful on that front. I decided to sign up with this class action lawsuit 
Yeah, so it can help a lot of other students in similar position that I was in. I am the system-wide Title IX Director for the University of California, and the purpose of this office is to provide support and guidance for the campus Title IX offices. Our Title IX officers are experts on this issue. They're well-versed in what constitutes sexual harassment and what does not, and so they're using guidance that's issued by the Office for Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Education, and that's been employed for a long time, and they're using their experience as Title IX officers and their expertise. Has there been an increase in lawsuits against the UC system? There's been an, an increase in litigation across the country. All of these challenges present opportunities for us to learn and for us to improve the way that we do our work. Is the process fair as it is now? We know it is extremely important to pro provide a process that is fair to both parties that provides due process as it's been defined by the courts. And at the same time, it's important that we treat the parties who are engaged in the process with respect and with kindness and with compassion as we navigate this extremely difficult process. We mainly represent students or professors or others who've been uh, accused um, in Title IX matters. I know that since 2011, there's been approximately 400 and 50 lawsuits filed in the United States about this issue. And I think the misconception that some people have is that we're fighting against the accusers or fighting against the complainants, but that's not the case at all. What we're fighting for is for fairness and for, for both sides to stand some sort of a chance and to get a, a fair shot and a fair shake. The whole process from the beginning to the end is much more complicated than it should be for students. The students have no right to an attorney. Uh, the evidence isn't given to them until right before the hearing. Oftentimes it's heavily redacted. There's unknown witnesses. So it's like the school prosecuting a student, but the student is really left to fend for themselves and usually it doesn't fare well for them. If there's no hostile environment, if both students can continue going to class and no one's deprived of their right to an education, then maybe they should allow that to resolve itself. Oftentimes it doesn't even start with a complainant. There's no actual complainant. It's just information that's come to the attention of the Title IX office that there could be some situation of, of misconduct. I'm a single mom. I have a 20 years old son uh, that is attending a community college and he's being accused of Title IX. He's being uh, accused of inappropriate touching. I went over there to the college and they gave me this letter where they say that they find, after the investigation done, they will find my son guilty and he was going to be suspended for semester. They were able to destroy with that 18 years of work. 18 years of work with a kid with so much disadvantage. My son has autism, yet is not mentally retarded. Had you ever heard of Title IX before you were accused? No, I haven't heard of Title IX. Do you remember how they told you? Did you? Did somebody tell you? Did you get a letter? Did you get an email? Letter. A letter. You got a letter and the letter said you've been... Accused. Of sexual harassment. Yeah, accused of sexual harassment. Got it. And are you still in college? Yep, yeah, I'm still in college. And how do you feel about college? I feel excited about college. What do you think will happen with your Title IX cases? Title IX cases has to be removed from restrictions so we can celebrate.
there is value on having Title IX. I think that the way that it is applied and the way that it is used right now is, I don't want to sound judgmental, but it sound that it, 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 it's, it's, it's not helping because the way that it is used and the way that this, uh, our sons are, you know, accused on using the Title IX, it's, it makes no sense. Somehow in this country, we have evolved into a sexual left and a sexual right. The sexual right thinks that there is no crisis and that most people who are accused are falsely accused, where the left is very pro-victim and believes in things like rape culture and the idea that we need to fundamentally shift the paradigm of male-female power in order to create equity. Our society simply does not believe that women tell the truth. So I think it's important that when we talk about this issue, we focus on the victims. I absolutely think that there has been a significant increase in the lawsuits filed by respondents. There's no, there's no question about that. I don't think that's reflective of the fact that there have been more false allegations or a higher rate of substantiating those allegations against them. I think it's more the result of a highly motivated and mobilized group of men's rights activists. And frankly, I think that the schools are far more concerned with mitigating their liability, their legal liability, because they are being sued by respondents' attorneys. And I can tell you from, from having represented survivors of sexual violence for a decade at this point, I've never had a client come to me and say that their primary goal was to punish the respondent. Their primary goal is almost always to protect themselves and, to, and or to protect other people from the conduct that they're worried about. So I don't share the view that there um, needs to be changes to procedures um, to increase due process for respondents. I think that already exists. Know Your Nine is a survivor and youth-led project of Advocates for Youth. So our team is built up of mostly survivors ages 15 to 24 who are working across the country to empower students to end sexual violence. I think that institutions at the end of the day are businesses and so they will try to advance their own um, interest. And so we recognize that students just want to be safe. What we're seeing is that the Title IX process itself isn't the issue, it is the folks who are supposed to be administering it in the way that they've been told that they're supposed to, and seeing them not do their job, seeing them find loopholes, uh, see them be biased towards respondents, um, and also seeing schools just have no interest in showing up in the way that they are supposed to. For all cases, I would say 90% or more are male, are male accused students. Um, and then there's some that are uh, female accused students. No transgender that I'm aware of, um, but, but same sex uh, couples or same sex interactions are now, uh, are an issue. Um, so and that, that raises an interesting conundrum because if Title IX is supposed to make sure there's no hostile environment based on gender, if you have people of the same gender, it's very difficult to say that you've created a hostile environment based on one gender over another gender. So to be clear, a Title IX case is not exclusive to sexual violence. Sexual violence is one type of sexual harassment, which is one type of gender-based discrimination. We also represent and assist students who are experiencing other types of gender-based discrimination, and I can give you an example. There are non-binary students or transgender students who are experiencing bullying, harassment, misgendering, discrimination, other types of violence, also sexual violence, because of their status as a transgender person or a non-binary person. Do you feel that victims and survivors 
of sexual assault who've gone through the Title IX process, that they are heard more than they used to be. I don't see that personally. The schools have actually swung the pendulum too far in the other direction, and they are incentivized to find in favor of respondents. That is separate and apart and additional to the motivation that they already have to protect certain types of respondents, which we see all the time. For example, student athletes. I'm here today because my sophomore year, I was raped by a fellow student athlete. So two weeks into my freshman year, um, I was raped by another student athlete. I reported it to the Dean of Students, who was in charge of Title IX. Reporting it didn't really help at all. It kind of made matters worse. I feel like the process was more harmful to me in a lot of ways than what actually happened to me. They told me I couldn't go to the city police. I had to go to the on-campus police. Um, I didn't feel like I was safe. They switched the Title IX coordinator in the middle of my process. I had to go, I had to restart the entire process. So that was, that meant reinvestigating everything and re, like opening everything up. And they kept reopening it, but they didn't really tell me why they were reopening it. The statements that I had written before, they all the times were wrong, the dates were wrong. They found him responsible twice, and he appealed it twice. It seemed that um, nothing was being resolved, and there was it was kind of stagnant. Because they have the um, the mutual no contact orders, so anywhere that he was. I couldn't be, and anywhere that I was, he couldn't be. It made it very difficult for me to go out, to go to school even, which was the main thing. I don't think that justice was served. Um, they didn't even suspend him. It is resolved now, yeah. But that was through an outside settlement because the school never finished it. Um, I had to eventually transfer to another school. I haven't heard anyone's experience with Title IX that wasn't so traumatizing to them that they felt like dropping out of school or changing schools or like their school wanted them to leave or their school was just like mad at them for reporting it or acted like they were an issue. At the end of my second semester at this new school, something similar had happened and um, because of my lack of trust in the system and me had had been gone through that system before and knowing how how it'll all play out, like I don't feel confident in going to report this because I know that they're not gonna help me. If they're there to be impartial, then they should act impartial. They shouldn't act like we're bothering them by making them do their jobs. The focus is not on whether or not someone was falsely accused of a crime. It's more whether or not this particular type of school misconduct occurred and whether or not it is interfering with the victim's access to education. It's important to remember that we are not talking about a crime. I know that sexual assault is a crime, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about criminal procedures or protections that criminal defendants are entitled to and that we as a civil rights organization are 100% in support of. One thing I have come to believe is that both sides can be genuinely equally convinced that their version of events is true. That one side really believes that the encounter was consensual and the other side truly believes that it was not. And neither person is lying. And that makes these cases so incredibly difficult to litigate and also for anybody to decide. The death penalty, the academic death penalty, is expulsion. There's nothing to suggest that the academic death penalty does anything to promote the healing of the person who was violated. And so that's why I think we really need to look seriously at some kind of alternative to the way that we're doing things now, because I don't think you'll find anybody who is going to sit here and tell you with a straight face that what we are doing right now with Title IX on college campuses is working. So you have all these different actors. You have the federal government under Obama saying, okay, colleges, you have to do it a certain way. Colleges complying. 
then new election, new president, new secretary of education. Every survivor of se sexual misconduct must be taken seriously. Every student accused of sexual misconduct must know that guilt is not predetermined. Basically, what happened was that <clears throat> when Trump was elected, he appointed Betsy DeVos to be the Secretary of Education. She proposed various regulations. My assumption is that when they are about to go into law, there will be a lawsuit to enjoin them from going into effect, and there will be further litigation about whether or not they'll ever actually be in place. I disagree with many of the proposed regulations put forward by Betsy DeVos, and ERA disagrees with them very strongly. We have already sued the Department of Education. Um, ERA is one of several co-plaintiffs um, in a lawsuit filed against the Department of Education precisely for the rescission of the 2011 guidance and implementation of new guidance. So yes, we would um, consider bringing litigation. Looking ahead, we are confronted with the prospect of the Title IX rules that have been proposed by the U.S. Department of Education, about which we have very serious concerns. So this is difficult work for the University of California and for universities across the country. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of flux. When Betsy DeVos proposed changes to Title IX, we began to see schools immediately stop doing their job. Um, they became lax on survivors' rights. We are not seeing high levels of false reports. What we're actually seeing is survivors coming forward trying to get basic protections and accommodations to stay in school, being denied them and being pushed out of school. Um, about a third of survivors drop out of school. I don't know that you're ever going to get to a point or ever have a system where there's some universal truth that's magically arrived at. I just don't think that's possible. On one hand, you have people screaming about rape apologists, and then on the other hand, you have people screaming about witch hunts, and this is exactly the problem. And I just don't think that it's helpful or productive, and all it does is divide people even more and estrange them even more and take us further away from the possibility of ever agreeing on some kind of process that's more likely to make both sides at least somewhat healed or somewhat satisfied walking away.